Our God is still on his throne and ruling the affairs of man. Even as he does not change, his truths have not changed. Thankfully, God still has a people which proclaim that old-time religion setting forth his sovereignty and the old paths of truth where we can find rest for our souls. Welcome to Word of Sovereign Grace, a ministry of Paradise Primitive Baptist Church in Arlington, Texas. Get your Bible, call your friends, and sit back as we open the King James Scriptures to explore the glorious Word of Sovereign Grace. Here's this week's message. Once again, I'm thankful for the opportunity to be in the house of the Lord. I can't think of anywhere else that I would rather be this morning. Um, we're living in a very interesting time, very challenging time. Um, but you know, we over the years, I'm sure that you've heard me talk about the immu- immutability of God and the fact that God never changes. And God's Word does not change. It's the one constant that we have. And the world does not corroborate the Word of God. Uh, in other words, you're not going to find uh, the Word of God agreeing with the world. The Word of God will tell you that the Lord is... Uh, not in agreement with the world and the things of the world. He says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Now you know the rest of that. So there is profit to be had in this Word. The one immutable that comes from the immutable, unchangeable God. It is the one constant that does not change unless we've picked up some perverted version off the shelf in a Christian bookstore, some ESV or M-I-C-K-E-Y M-O-U-S-E version. And don't really laugh at that because it would not surprise me if they have not, they they don't have some children's versions that (laughs) go that direction. But I believe that the King James Bible is the the pure Word of God, the preserved Word of God. He says He'll preserve His Word unto all generations. Why is that? It's because we need that one constant. Things in the world around us are changing constantly. And, And that is, in life, that's one thing that is permanent is change. Um... But our God does not change. He says, I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore you sons of Jacob are not consumed. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So when we we see all the trouble and all the things that are taking place in the world, uh, where do we go but to the Lord and to His Word to, to find the answers? Uh, for the challenges that we find in this life. And I don't have to tell any of you that there are plenty of challenges uh, in the world. Uh, That's why you'll always hear me say that God's called us out of the world um, or to sanctify or set ourselves apart from the world. To come out and be separate, He says, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, saith the Lord. So, this word is to... He says in John chapter 17 in the Lord's Prayer, He says, Lord, sanctify them through, through Thy truth. And He says, Thy word is truth. So if we want to set ourselves apart, the, the way that it happens is through the Word of God. It doesn't happen through a Marvel comic book. It doesn't happen through a Lewis Lemoor novel. Or it doesn't happen through a Chilton's auto, auto manual. It happens through this book right here. And as I tried to briefly state in my prayer that I don't believe that any man ever tried to convince me that this Bible was the Word of God. I believe that God does that individually and personally with each and every one of His children to convince them that it is. Uh, So I believe this book. I don't believe the world. And the problem that we face in this day and time is that the devil has an agenda He has an agenda of fear, and as I told you briefly last week, that he's the father of lies, and he has been telling some whoppers 
uh, I also told you that it's easier to lie to someone than to convince someone that they have been lied to. Uh, but the devil has been telling some very large and gigantic lies for the purpose of making God's people think that we're insignificant. Well, God's people are significant. God's people have been placed in a special place in God's creation. For God so loved the world, which I believe speaks to the quality of God's love. And having been created in the image of the one true and living God, that's you and I. We've been created in His image and His likeness. In Genesis 1.26, He said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And we know that the Bible teaches us that we've been predestined to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. So, I believe that God's people are significant, and I believe that God's creation is in a special place. Last week, I briefly touched on the subject of geocentricity. And that's the, that's the idea that everything, that the earth does not move, and that everything revolves around the earth. Now, I know that's totally contrary to what everyone's been taught in school. We've been indoctrinated our entire lives to believe uh, the, the system that Copernicus came up with, which is called the heliocentric system, that says that everything revolves around the sun. Well, it's very interesting to note that Copernicus was a sun worshiper. But anyway, up until the time of Copernicus, everyone believed geocentricity. Why? Because it is in this book. And it's a constant. They believed what they saw with their eyes. You ever heard what you see is what you get? Well, we need to believe our the senses that God has given us, the the senses of the you know the five senses, and some say the sixth sense. We need to believe the senses that God has given us, and just observe, believe what what it is that we're observing. But anyway, up until the time of Copernicus. Uh, Everyone believed in geocentricity and believed the Word of God that, that tells us that the world does not move. Now, the challenge still remains for anyone to come up with one scripture uh, that says that the earth moves. But you will come up with many scriptures that talks about the sun moving, that talks about the stars moving, that talks about uh, uh, the moon and and. and and the constellations moving, but you will not find one that says that the earth is moving. And I've, I've written down the one that comes the closest to us to it, and it has nothing to do with it at all. And uh, what I will want to do, the Lord being my helper, over the next few weeks, if you'll tolerate me, <laughs> and if you won't get your TV bricks out and throw them at me, I want to talk about uh, the foundations the foundation of God's creation. Then I want to try to talk about the circuits and the courses. Then I want to talk about motion. And and I'm talking about bringing the Word of God to you. Now, what I am advocating or talking about is not anything that's new. Now, it may be new to your hearing because it's been buried by the world. And let me tell you the implications uh, of the Copernicus, uh, uh, Copernican revolution. When Copernicus first introduced his, his heliocentric system, there was a gigantic controversy in the church uh, among, the, among the Catholics, uh, but it, not only them, but there was a gigantic controversy. And, and w- this is what happens. This, is turned, this turned thousands of years of belief upside down uh, that came from the Word of God. And now men, when it comes to the things of the cosmos uh, and God's creation, where do they look but to NASA? You know, the Scripture warns us about the, uh, the oppositions of science falsely so-called. I believe that true science will always corroborate the Word of God and say, yes, 
what God's Word says is true. True science will always do that. But there is a false science out there. So what, what happened during the Copernican Revolution has turned everything upside down. Then if anybody, and I'm talking about Christians, uh, by and large, if they want to know anything about the cosmos, they look to Carl Sagan or, or, or Hawkins or... Uh, uh, Tyson, uh, no, I'm not talking about Tyson Bray, but they'll look to NASA and the, and the scientists of NASA to get their answers. Well, that's a problem in as much as, well, we really can't trust the, the Bible, what the Bible says about what God created, then what does that do if it doesn't kick the door in for us to doubt everything that the Word of God says? Doesn't it? If you don't believe what the Bible's, when it comes down to it, you're either going to believe what God said or you're going to believe what science said. And if you believe what science said, you're not believing what God said. Why are you even wasting your time picking this book up and believing it at all? Uh, I've had people that try, that, that want to take one scripture, and they use that one about Passover or, or Easter over in the Acts chapter 12 to try to prove that that should have said Passover and get you to doubt the Word of God in one place. And when they do that, they've got you. They've got you. Then, then they can start, they'll start whittling away at other things. And say, well, if you doubt that over here, then you need to doubt this over here. Well, I believe this book. And this book talks about the fact that the earth does not move and that everything else does, even though we've been taught all of our lives to the contrary. And by the way, you know that this system that Copernicus set up, it opened the door for the Big Bang Theory and evolution. Now, now that this is all out there and people are believing uh, this, we can come in with uh, the evolution thing. Well, what I want to talk about this morning, the Lord be my helper, is let's talk about the foundation first. First thing first. What is the foundation of God's creation? And once, once we see what the foundation of God's creation is, then we can look to the scriptures that tell us what, what it is that moves in the cosmos and the heavens and the earth and all those things. So that's what I want to do, the Lord being my helper. And I've got several scriptures laid out here that talk about the foundation of the earth and the foundation of the world. Now, I know that there are a lot of uh, jewels here uh, and things that we tie to, to the doctrine of election and predestination. And it amazed me uh, over the past few years as I've been conversing with others on Facebook about this particular subject, how they just completely miss uh, what this is saying. You know, how many times have we heard, according as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world? Well, we think about, yeah, God chose us before the world began, but we don't see the fact that He's telling us that the world is the foundation. You know, that's just not there for filler material. That's there. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And uh, let's find over here in Psalm chapter 102, verse 25. He said, Of old thou hast laid the foundation of the earth. Now, what is the foundation? In the, if in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and He says, Of old thou hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. You're going to read in the Genesis account as God was creating that He started right here. He started right here. He created, uh, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. But the scripture tells us that uh, on the first day that God said, let there be light, and God was moving on the earth. God worked on the earth, then He worked His way out, and then He came back here and He finished it up. So, the earth is the foundation of God's creation. Unlike... Uh, what Big Bang is telling you that the earth is some significant little speck and, and one among trillions or sextillions of planets or stars or galaxies that's so, so far away you know and uh, th th try to make it look like it's in no special place but I believe that the earth is God's creation and it's 
in a special place. It's in the center of God's creation. Now, I mentioned to you last week that it's... uh, One of the things that got me to thinking about this several years ago is I was reading, and I got down to the fourth day of creation in Genesis chapter 1. And it stood out, it jumped out at me that it says that God created the the sun and the moon on the fourth day. Now wait a minute. I thought it said in uh, uh, on the first day it said God said let there be light and there was light. Well, that's not talking about sunlight because He didn't create the sun until the fourth day, and that's what got me to thinking about all this and checking into this and finding out that there's more people. There are a lot of people that believe this system, but it's being suppressed. In our school systems, it's not taught as an alternative in our school. You know, they don't teach in uh, uh, in our school systems evolution that that uh, creation is an alternative. They just say it's evolution. And, and here's an alternative of, that God created it. They don't teach that. They have an agenda. So they're not teaching. They're not teaching heliocentrism and geocentrism. They're just teaching heliocentrism, and, and they leave it at that. Stating that's fact, that's the way it is. But before Copernicus came along, nobody had had, uh, had believed such. And like I said, there was a big fight that was on when all this came out. And it's all geared by the enemy to undermine the Word of God. Uh, Isaiah chapter 48, he says, My hand also hath laid the foundation of the earth. And my right hand has spanned the heavens. And when I call to them, they stand up together. You know, if you think about the hand, the right hand, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, we know that all things were created by Jesus Christ, is what we're told in the New Testament. But He laid the foundation of the earth. And as I asked the question last week, when a, when you begin to have a, have a project, you begin to build, what's the first thing that you do? You lay the foundation. You don't you don't build the you don't frame it you don't put the roof on it you don't do anything until you got the foundation laid. Well, over and over and over in Scripture, we're going to see that God refers to the earth as the foundation of His creation. He says, "My hand also hath laid the foundation of what of the earth, and my right hand has spanned the heavens." Uh, you know, we we try to comprehend how God did all this when the Scripture says in some places that He just spoke and it came to pass and it was. I don't think this was a hard thing for God. I really don't. Uh, But it's hard for us to wrap uh, wrap our mypy brain around some of the the depth of some of the scripture that it's talking about here but I believe it when he says that the earth is the, uh, that the foundation of God's creation is the earth he doesn't talk about the sun being the foundation he doesn't talk about anything else being the foundation except the earth the foundation of the world and the foundation of the earth uh, like I said, you, you'll not be able to find one scripture that says that the earth moves and you won't find a scripture that says that anything is the foundation other than the world or the earth, which are one and the same. Uh, Zechariah 12, 1, he says, The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, which stretcheth forth the heavens and layeth the foundation of the earth, and form the spirit of man within him. So somebody tell me what the foundation is. If we don't believe two or three scriptures, or will we believe 20 or 30, or 200 or 300? How many does it take to convince us that what the, what the foundation is? And, and we know in all of this that Jesus Christ Himself is the chief cornerstone, Right? Another one, he's, he's very involved in it. This is to his honor, to his glory and praise. So, he says, The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, which stretches forth the heavens and layeth the foundation of the earth and formeth the spirit of man within him. That's talking about Adam. And on the sixth day, uh, Brother Wes and I were discussing, I think it was last week, that God created Adam on the sixth day. Or, or I was talking to somebody about that. 
had God created man before that, he would try to take in credit for the creation. But he created Adam on the last day, on the sixth day, then on the seventh day God rested. So, but he created, he, he blew into his nostrils the breath of life and he became a living soul, is what the scripture would tell us. <clears throat> so he, he laid the foundation of the earth and he formeth the spirit of man within him. Now, in, in Hebrews, the Apostle Paul, uh, I don't know why I have, I'm, I'm going to stop making comment that I believe that Paul wrote uh, Hebrews and then I can defend it. I'm just going to say that Paul wrote it because that's what I believe to be the case. Um, if someone has a problem with that, we can discuss it and I, I can pull the scripture out to, sh- to show you that I believe that it indicates very strongly that the Apostle Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. And I think the reason that he didn't put his name on it is because it would have been rejected out of hand uh, by those by those Jews that knew him, uh, but this this was book was written to them on uh, on the cusp of the destruction of Jerusalem before Jerusalem would be destroyed in AD 70s. So that's like if somebody has got a problem with me and I wanted to speak a truth to them, if I put my name on it, they're going to see my name and throw it up away immediately. Had they seen Paul's hand or salutation on this letter, they may have thrown it away immediately and not even read it. Uh, that, that was this, the, uh, some of the, the antagonism that they had against Paul. Uh, remember, they sought to kill him, and uh, <laughs> people took, uh, 40 men took a vow that they wouldn't eat or drink until they had killed Paul, and a lot of different things they, that happened to Paul because he was preaching this truth. But uh, the the truth of the matter was that he loved his brethren when he said in Romans chapter 10, My prayer to God and my heart's desire for Israel is that they might be saved, for I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. So in the Hebrew letter, um, Paul had this to say, And thou, Lord, in the beginning has laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hand. Now when did he do it? Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. There, there it is again. I'll repeat it. It's time, space, and matter. Uh, all the things that physics has to deal with. But he says, Thou hast in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth. So, And the heavens are the works of thy hands. As I told you in Genesis, God started here, He worked out into the heavens, and He came back and He finished it all here. Okay? So uh, the earth is the foundation, and and I told you early on that some of these some of these texts are we gloss over certain parts of them, and and uh, uh, in order to extract different points of doctrine, and and as I've been talking to some of the brethren over the past, they seem to miss the 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 rest of the beauty in the text. Now here's one in Matthew chapter 25, and it says. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Well, I'm always they're always talking about how that the kingdom has been prepared for us before the world began. And I believe that and I say yea and amen and thank God for it. And that's good news to know that God had a purpose, that He chose the people out and He gave them to Christ and Christ came and died for them and He rose again for their justification and He's coming back to resurrect them and take them home to heaven in the world of glory. I say amen to that. But they, they, they fail to recognize the other piece here when it says from the foundation of the world. Now, I know that you're going to get tired of hearing me say this, but I'm going to lay this out, and I want you to see that this is Scripture. And if the Lord is my helper, next week when we talk about courses and circuits, and the week after that we talk about motion of the cosmos, you're going to see that this is coming from the Word of God. This is not something that I'm making up. You know, the, there's a, a parable that says the kingdom of heaven is like a man that brought forth from his treasure things old and things new. 
Now, this may, like I said, this may be new to your hearing, but this is not new to the Word of God. It's, it's not been taught by and large, especially by old Baptists. Uh, I love my brethren, but you know, a lot of times it seems like they get stuck in one little, one little uh, place and they don't want to move away from that. But one of the things that I'm convinced and God has taught me is, is that I'm to preach all the counsel of God. And again, if it's in this book, it's profitable because He says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. For doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So if it's in this book, it's profitable. And I had a prominent minister tell me one time, what's all that good for? Well, I've tried to explain to you how that the enemy has, has done this to undermine the Word of God, to get you to doubt. Well, if you doubt the Word of God about the cosmos... Uh, about where you're actually living and the way that things work when God tells you how they work, you're just going to, you know, it'll be very easy to get you to disbelieve the rest of it. I believe this word. I don't understand it all. I may never understand it. I don't think I'll ever understand it in this lifetime. But I believe this book. I believe it. Um, and I... And I'm getting to where I have to challenge just about everything that the world's telling me about how how things are. Now, some of them are easy. We know since we're Christians and we believe in an intelligent design. In other words, we believe that the world was created by someone intelligent and it didn't just all happen by accident. Uh, it's easy for us to see that evolution is a big lie and a I think it's, I'm not going to call it a joke, but I'm sure the devil's probably laughing about it. That's easy for us to see. But there are other things that will show, and, and, the re, and like I say, why is the devil spending so much effort to, do, to deceive God's people and to lie to them? It's because he's trying to hide the fact that God is. Well, if, the, if evolution is true... <laughs> Must not be any God, you know. It, it's a con, it's a concerted effort uh, to deceive God's people. If our gospel be hid, uh, it is hid to them that are lost, whom the God of this world hath what blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel should shine unto them. This is tough. This is way tougher than Christmas. I mean, it is. But once you get in here, and like I say, I'll, I'll bring you the evidence from this book, not from my opinion, not from the world especially, and anything that the world had to say, but from this book, which we trust, and we always say is the only rule of faith and practice. The only one. The only rule of faith and practice. I'll bring it to you from here. Then you'll, then you'll have to decide, do you want to believe this book or do you want to believe what the world's been telling you? When all along God's warning you, watch out for the world. If any man love the world and the things of the world, the love of the Father's not in him. Uh, and... In the world you have tribulation, but be a good cheer. I've overcome the world. I mean, over and over and over, he's warning you about the world. That the world is not your friend. That the world cannot receive the Spirit of truth. But God's people can. God's people can receive the Spirit of truth. So he says, he'll say to them on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you. Isn't that a wonderful thought to know? Aren't you waiting? Aren't you longing to hear that proclamation and the exoneration of God's people when He says, Come! You blessed my Father. You were chosen in Him before the world began. Come and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. <clears throat> Luke chapter 11 and the Lord was talking to those Pharisees about all the, all the bloodshed 
He was talking about the days of God's vengeance that were coming upon the nation of Israel for the rejection of all the righteous prophets. And they would also reject Jesus Christ and cry out to Pilate, His blood be upon us and our children. And it was. And the Lord says in Luke 11.50, that the blood of all the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the world. Now like I say, there's more that we can pull out of that. I was going to say extrapolate, but Betty will she'll hit me in the car on the way home and say, what, what are you talking about those words like that? More than we can extract or pull or see. Okay? Uh, there's, more, there's more to it, but the, the, the main thing that I want to do is show you where the foundation is. Father, in, in, um, in John chapter 17, this is the Lord's Prayer. Father, I will that they also whom Thou hast given, given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which Thou hast given me, for Thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. Before the world was ever created, Jesus is saying that Jesus was with the fullness of the Father. And uh, He says, I, I will the same thing for those that were given. He says, I will that those that Thou hast given Me be with Me. And that, that's a blessed, uh, blessed promise right there. Like I say, there's more. These are precious points of doctrine that we hear all the time. Yet we never hear anybody talk about the foundation of the world. Well, we're going to talk about it some more. But that's the Lord's Prayer. And that's the same chapter where He says, Sanctify them through Thy truth. And He says, Thy word is truth. This word right here is the truth of God. Okay? And this is, how, this is how we sanctify ourselves by coming in line with what this, what this uh, Word teaches. We're hearers and doers of God's Word. But otherwise, we just deceive ourselves. The devil didn't make you do it. Uh, if you're a hearer only and not a doer, you're deceiving yourselves. You don't, blame, you don't have nobody else to blame but yourself. But we're hearers, I pray, and doers of God's Word. And all this is geared, brothers and sisters, to cause us to draw closer to God and to see how, uh, to have a sense of how great that love that He has for you and how, how much that He loved you. It, it's, I've always said that I don't understand why God would love such a sinner as myself. But I know that, that He does and that He loves you as well. And when we try to, to, to discern why would God love somebody so worthless as, as myself, well that in and of itself just magnifies the greatness and the mercy of God's love toward His people. But God's people are special. They're peculiar people too. He says, zealous of good works. We just, brothers and sisters, we don't understand how much the Lord really loves us. I know He says, Greater love hath no man than this, that He lay down His life for His friends. And He calls us His friends. He says, You are my friends, for I have told you all things whatsoever that I'm doing. I'm, I'm paraphrasing that. But He laid down His life for His friends. We'll be able to, on the morning of the resurrection, we'll be able to comprehend We'll be able to be able to comprehend the, the height, the depth, the breadth of the love of God. We'll be able to comprehend we'll, because we'll see Him as He is, and we'll be satisfied. But not until then. Um, so, Ephesians one four. According as He hath chosen us in Him, before what? Before He laid the foundation of the world. The foundation of what? The world. What's, what's the foundation? What is the world? It's the foundation of God's creation. He said, keeps saying it over and over and over. 
that the earth or the world is the foundation of His creation. And that's a beautiful text that I hear all the time, but nobody's ever talked about the foundation or the world part of that. Or the world being the foundation. Now, you have to take in mind, too, that some of the way this text is laid out, uh, we have to consider all of it. There's a scripture that says if all the books were written that should be written about all that Jesus said and did, the world itself could not contain them all. So having said that, I don't believe that God wasted any space in this one book that He did write. Does that make sense? So it's it's all there for a reason. But it's a blessing to know that we were chosen in Christ before the world began, before we were born, before we had done any good or evil. We were chosen in Christ and uh, our names were penned in the Lamb's book of life and we were given to Christ and Christ came and died, suffered, bled and died and rose again. Uh, and He came at the appropriate time, that, at the appointed time of God. But He says that we were, we were chosen in Him before God ever laid the foundation of this creation. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 3, He says, For we which have believed do enter into rest. As He has said, I have sworn in my wrath, if, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. You know, Entering into the rest of God. What is that about? That's about believing in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Believing and understanding that when Jesus said it is finished. uh, Having an understanding that nothing, there is nothing that we can add to that. There is nothing that we can take away from that. Uh, it's, It's stating that salvation is of the Lord. And when we understand that salvation is of the Lord and that we're saved by His grace plus nothing, then we can rest from our works as God rested from His works. Do you want to do you want to rest from your works, or do you want to carry the burden of I just got to measure up, I just got to be good enough, or I won't make it to heaven? That's a heavy burden to carry. Let me tell you. But when you know that Jesus uh, finished the work that God gave him to do, and that's what he said in John chapter 17, I finished the work which I was given me to do, uh, and all that I was given me, I have lost nothing. That's rest. Now we can go about our business of serving God in this lifetime, knowing that that we we serve Him and that we love Him because He first loved us, and that we serve Him because we're grateful that that we we have a, a motive of gratitude and thankfulness for how great things that He's done for us. Just like He told that wild Gadarene uh, that when He had cast out that legion of devils, and afterwards. All those spirits went out and went into the swine and about 2,000 ran down into the sea and were choked in the sea. And all the people of the city came out to see what was happened and they found that that wild Gadarene uh, sitting and clothed and in his right mind. And there's a message right there. If you want to explore that, he was sitting and he was resting. He was clothed. He had the righteousness of Christ and he was in his right mind. He had the mind of Christ in him. There's a lot there. Don't have time to get it all. But we have rest. He says, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world, do you realize that Christ stood as a lamb slain? Uh, I don't even think I've got that one on my list. That Christ stood as a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. That means that all those that died on the other side of the cross, if their names are penned in the Lamb's book of life, I believe that when they die, they went immediately unto glory. I don't believe they went to hell or to a compartment of hell called paradise. The Apostle Paul tells me that paradise is in the third heaven. And I... uh, That see, people that don't have an understanding of the Word of God, they say, well, what happened to everybody that died before Jesus? Well, we'll have to put them down here like with Luke chapter 16. We'll have to put them down here in Abraham's bosom and this other compartment. And we'll call that paradise. Uh, 
but anyway, it gets convoluted. Jesus stood as a lamb slain from the foundation of the world, and I believe all the way back to Adam. The Scripture says that Adam was a son of God, and all those from Adam all the way to the last one that will be born into this world, uh, the last one of God's elect, they're all going to be saved the same way by, by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and uh, uh, salvation will be of the Lord. It won't be of them. So I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to move on. I'm starting to, the time starting to get away from me. So in First Peter, um, chapter one, verse twenty, speaking of Christ, who said, "Who verily was foreordained? When was he foreordained? Before the foundation of the world." So Christ was forward before the world began. The council of God, Isaiah chapter 6 says, The Lord said, Whom shall I send and who shall go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. And the things that, uh, that's not talking about Isaiah there, that's a prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ. You look at Matthew chapter 13 and Acts chapter 28, and it says the things that he did there and how that he made the hearts of the people wax gross. And the, uh, uh, lest they should hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and, and be uh, healed and not, uh, be converted and I should heal them. That's what Isaiah is talking about. But before the world began, there was a council. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Who is the us? Genesis 1.26, God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Genesis 1.26, whom shall I send and whom shall go for us? Then said I, here am I, send me. So that was the son responding. <clears throat> you see that Isaiah didn't have the power uh, to heal and convert like the Lord Jesus Christ did. Like You can read about it in Matthew chapter 13, Acts 28. So it was all done. Who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world but was manifest in these last times for you. So the point there is that God did some things before He laid the foundation. Okay, Before the earth was ever created. Before Genesis 1-1 ever took place. God, God did some things and that, that's that covenant of grace that we talk about. That covenant of grace that is so uh, precious to us <clears throat> and that we should be so grateful to the Lord for. For thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And he did. He did. He didn't. God didn't try to save anybody. I, I feel so bad for people that think that God's trying to get, get sinners saved. He's trying to get you to come down the aisle to get your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. God's trying to do this, and he's trying to do that, and we just can't. You were gonna help him. I don't believe that. I looked and he said, There was none to help. Therefore hath mine own arm brought forth salvation. That's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, the arm of God. We talked about in some of these scriptures earlier. The arm of God. My arm has stretched forth the heavens. No. <clears throat> he came to save. He's he is the mighty one. He is mighty to save. He didn't try. He's not trying to save people for heaven and immortal glory. Now where people get confused is that there is a gospel calling, a calling to church fellowship, a calling to discipleship. All, only, <clears throat> well, all of God's people that are, whose names are penned in the last book of life before the foundation of the world, they will be born again at some point and become sons and daughters of God. Now, they may never darken the doors of a church house. Where some people get confused is that there, that's an irresistible call of grace, by the way. There is also a gospel call where we are called gospelly to take up our cross and follow the Lord and become disciples and be converted. You see, there's a difference between regeneration and the new birth and conversion and discipleship. And if we can't discern the difference, we're going to get confused. 
1 Samuel 2, 8, He raises up the poor out of the dust. And He lifted up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes and to make them inherit Thy glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and He hath set the world upon them. Now here, this is an indication of, of static earth. That's just the first. I'm not going to give it. We'll talk about them. We'll talk about them in more detail, the Lord willing, the next couple of weeks. But here he's talking about that the earth is set on pillars. That's not the only place. There are several places. Again, I'll, I'll issue the challenge. Someone please show me from a King James, from a King James, where it says that the earth is moving. Someone show me. You know why? I, I, I'm confident to say that because it's not in there. But it talks about everything else moving. But the earth is set on pillars. He says He raises the poor out of the dust and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes and to make them inherit the throne of thy glory. Do you know that's what God has done for us? He's lifted us. He, he saw us polluted in our own blood. And He cast a mantle of, chair, of, of love upon us. And He drew us with the cords of His love. And He lifted us up and He cleaned us up. And He brings us into His kingdom that we might eat and drink at His table in His kingdom. And we're like Mephibosheth who was lame because of a fall. But he got to eat at the king's table. That's you and I. That's one of some other things that he's saying here. Let me read it again. He raises up the poor out of the dust and lifted up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's. And he set the world upon them. Just think about that for a little bit. Now here's one text that comes the closest that I can find to any kind of motion of the earth. Now, you remember last week I said, thank God the earth's not moving for when it is. It's called an earthquake. Right? Think about that. He says in Job chapter 9, verse 6, he says, which shaketh the earth out of her place and the pillars thereof tremble if the Lord causes an earthquake. And we talk about the tectonic plates underneath the crust of the earth that shift and so on. And a lot of that is true science. A lot of that can be proven. But now, like I said, there is true science and there is science falsely so-called. But that's the closest text that I can find to the earth moving is when it trembles during an earthquake. Uh, science says, the, the heliocentric system says, that the earth is spinning a thousand miles an hour at the equator. Um, did you ever stop to think, though, what is the speed of sound? You think, of the, think of the sound barrier that's continually be broken. If the earth is spinning at a thousand miles an hour at the equator, there would be a continual sonic boom going off that nobody's ever heard. But anyway, they say we're spending 1,000 miles an hour at the equator and that we're rotating 67,000 miles an hour in orbit around the sun. I don't feel any of that. Trust your senses. <laughs> Trust your senses. You know, Brother Lloyd was talking last week. I remember when I was a kid, I was being taught the lesson and then uh, I would go home and i said, well, you know, the earth's spinning and if I just jump up long enough, then it'll move up underneath me. Well, that makes sense. I mean, after all, well, they, now they say, well, you know, the ether. Well, the ether moves along with the earth. Well, if the ether moves along with the earth, and when I say ether, I'm talking about, we're talking about particles that are, that are 30 times smaller than, atom, uh, than atoms, and, and, and it's the medium through which light moves. But they say if the ether moves along with the earth, well, if that's the case, then why do clouds go different directions? I've seen clouds going north to south and uh, uh, west to east and all different directions. If, if the ether's moving with the earth, why do the clouds move in different directions? Well, you know, uh, Einstein's theory of relativity was all about disproving that there was an ether. Uh, 
And it's been disproven. <laughs> By the way, it's been disproven in the year since that there is an ether. Um, here's another thing that you... Uh, and I'm not going to do all your study for you, but you need to do some studying on your own. But you'll find that there's not been one experiment, not one, that's proved that the earth is moving. And I, you, you can talk about the Michelson-Morley experiment and Aries failure and all these other experiments that have been done. Not one has proved that the earth is moving. That's a, that's a fact. And, and even, the, even the, the false scientists have to admit that. There's not one experiment that's been done that will prove that the earth is moving. Now I'm not just making this up. Check it out for yourselves. Uh, okay, two more. This is very quick. Isaiah 40, verse 22. It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and all the inhabitants of the earth are as grasshoppers. Now, some people quote that say that, see, there's proof that the earth is a sphere. That's the only place that the word circle is used in the Word of God is in Isaiah 40, verse 22. And that word circle there is shuwag and comes from Strong's H 2338. Now, Isaiah also says in Isaiah chapter 22, he's talking about uh, this treasurer, I can't remember, Sherboon the treasurer or whatever he's talking about, he's going to send him into captivity and God's going to judge him. And he says in Isaiah 22, 18, He will surely violently turn and toss thee like a ball into a large country. That's meaning Babylon. Into a, so God's going to take this man and He's going to toss him like a ball. This is the only place where the word ball is used in all the Scripture just like in Isaiah 40, that's the only place that the word circle is used. Now, if the earth were a ball, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to stir your pure minds now. I want you, don't, don't dismiss this until you get in the Word and check it for yourself. Now, if the earth were a ball, then why didn't Isaiah use, uh, use the same word that he did in Isaiah 22.18? Because there it says the ball is duer. It comes from Strong's H1752 out of the Hebrew. So, why didn't Isaiah in Isaiah 40 use the same word that he used for ball? But he says, He that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. Now, there, there's a lot of different things. I know, I know I've probably said some things. I hope nobody shut me off in the beginning. I hope that you'll listen to what it is I have to say before you judge. Remember the scripture says it's folly for a man to, to judge a matter before he hears it. And there, I'm not done. There's more to this. There's a lot more to this. And hopefully maybe over the next two or three weeks we, I can bring scripture to bear. And, it, and you say, why does all this matter? Well, it matters. Do you know, did you realize when people are realizing this, the, the, what the, the cosmology that the Bible teaches, that they're getting converted? That they're believing, yes, there is a God. And they're, they're seeing that Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. And they're making a profession of Him. Yes, it's important. Because the world, all the world's efforts are trying to hide God. NASA's not out there to prove God. If NASA would be honest, they would have proved God a long time ago. But NASA doesn't utter one word about the, 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 the reality that there is an intelligent design. They're always coming up with this gobbledygook about Big Bang, this happened, and they never give God the credit or the glory. That's why this is important. And I want to know the truth. Do you want to know the truth? You ever? Well, I don't, I don't know what movie that came from. Uh, that was who? Who was that? That uh, that one actor, Jack. It was Jack Nicholson. He said, "You can't handle the truth." Well, some of us. Jesus said in one place, "I have much more to say to you, but you can't bear it now." Well, let's let's start. Let's get back to basics. Stop. But turn off the 
evening news and stop listening to that garbage of <sighs> Dr. Phil, Dr. Oz, Oprah, Ellen, the Chew, the Buzz. I don't know what comes after the Chew. Is it the Purge? I don't know. We need to stop listening to all that garbage and get our nose in this book. See, that's, that's exactly what the world's accomplished. They've turned God's people away from looking to His book. God doesn't change. His Word doesn't change. Right and wrong hasn't changed. And it's not going to change. God's Word is immutable just as God is immutable. So, there's a lot to this. And I, I know that I may have disturbed. If I've disturbed you, understand I, di I did it in love. And I want to pure, stir up your pure mind. Sometimes, I, I don't know who's, I guess my brother, I don't know if y'all ever see the graphics that he does. He does a lot of different graphics. And uh, he, he put, made one, I don't know when he made it, I guess last night or whatever. It's called Two Jars. Two Jars that came from the same factory. They were made from the identical, from the same gla molten glass. They had the same stamps on them. They had the same lids. They hold the same amount of product. Except the difference is uh, one has vinegar and the other has honey. And you won't find out what's in one of them until you upset it. Until you, until you get it to open up. And I thought that, I like that. I like that. So we won't find out what's in a jar sometimes until we uh, until sometime until we upset it. I think that happened maybe four or five weeks ago. We upset one of the jars and we saw what came out. Hopefully, God gives us the grace to walk in love and, and to to walk in truth. He says He delights when His people walk in truth. God delights in it. But like I said, the truth is completely opposite of what the world's telling you. I thank you all for your good attention. As we stand and sing a suitable hymn, one or more have desired to unite with this body, this will be our Sovereign Grace, a ministry of Paradise Primitive Baptist Church in Arlington, Texas. Paradise Primitive Baptist Church is located at 5300 Mansfield Road in Arlington, Texas. Services begin at 1030 each Sunday morning. Plan to come and worship with us. To find out more about Paradise Primitive Baptist Church, visit www.paradisepbc.org. Be sure to visit our website for articles, video, and audio sermons, as well as biblical answers to your questions. Thanks for watching, and be sure to join us again next week. May God richly bless you.